Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. Hey, Engagers. Welcome once again to the Professor Game Podcast. We are today with not one but two guests, Julian and Chris. And guys, are you prepared to engage? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. This is one of, of the very few, you know, two-in-one interviews that we've done, but we have a very specific topic that we're going to be delving into today. But let me quickly introduce to you both Julian and Chris. Julian Kia is a bilingual series game facilitator and a team coach based in Berlin. Though activating learning environments with mind, minds on workshops methods, he enables, or through actually, he enables teams to exchange ideas authentically, promote mutual understanding, and strengthen their cooperation. Of course, these methods include trainings from the back of the room, Chiagi's interactive training and teaching strategies, agile classrooms, open space technology, and Lego series play. Tame, just some of them. He is also a Kanban management professional, a certified Scrum master, and a product owner, and holds a degree in business administration and a master's of business administration from the Steinbeis, Steinbeis, or something like that in German, probably, Mm -hmm. of international business and entrepreneurship. And since 2010, he works for clients and industries such as banking, consulting, e-commerce, aviation, luxury goods, engineering, pharmaceuticals, and insurance. And his mantra is rediscover learning, work smarter. On to Chris. He is a proactive, principle-centered evangelist of the Agile philosophy. As you can see, Agile, Scrum, and all these things are part of the <laughs> of the center of this episode today, because Chris is also passionate about driving continuous improvement and collaboration to improve Agile ways of working. He uses a combination of personal coaching, workshops, and training, and games, of course, to help solve problems ac- across organizations, within teams, and with individual so that is a bit about both is there julian chris is there anything else that i've missed that you probably want to mention before we kick off uh we know each other since yes ages <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's us though i think it was pretty good fantastic so another thing that i didn't actually mention is that you guys and that's the reason that's the the what brings us together at least this time it is the debriefing cube you might engagers you might remember or not from the interview with Cedric Pontet that he mentioned both uh, Chris and Julian and the debriefing cube. And first things first, Julian, Chris, what is a debriefing cube? (laughs) Uh, So it's a tool. Um, It's a tool to, uh, we've made uh, to help people who uh, have the opportunity to debrief things with their team or with a group of people uh, to do it really well and to get better at doing it. And to add to that, you know, the tool obviously includes a cube, <laughs> which uh, six lenses, so different perspectives. We're definitely going to talk about that later. And it includes a tons of questions, like more than 150 uh, debriefing, uh, powerful questions that one could use to prepare or then to uh, interact with um, learners during or after assimilation or game. That sounds fantastic. And just in case you're wondering and you haven't heard this debriefing thing before, you've heard it only in spy movies and so on. Debriefing in this case is what happens after, of course, you have some sort of activity, some learning activity, which could involve simulations, games, and so on. And then you do, you finish that, you sort of get out of the, the game, the simulated environment, and you say, well, you you sort of reflect. It's kind of a reflect time. I, I don't know if that's that's uh, that's accurate with what you guys are are talking about today, but that is at least the experience we have. Is there, is there anything that you would add to that sort of very wild definition I just gave? Mm. I think it's good. I think we would agree with the word reflect. Um, I think we, we would also add to that in terms of we absolutely and fundamentally believe that the most important part of the experience um, that we create when, when we're using games at work is the debrief is the reflection at the end of it because it's the thing that brings everything together and allows mm-hmm. us to really make mindfulness and, and make our uh, 
bring in, uh, internalize some of the lessons that, that game potentially taught us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, there were times where, where I started saying, ah, the debriefing is the other half, right, of the game. And then it started that I was saying, well, the game is like only a third. Now I just say the game is like a fourth of, of your whole intervention, <laughs> right? Because you get briefed. Um, you do the design, then you do facilitate, and then you want to, you know, have a powerful debriefing to enable learners to convert their experiences to actions uh, in the real world, right? That, that's what it's all about. That makes a lot, a lot of sense. In fact, I, we, were, we were chatting about this before we started. I, I mean, at the, the business school I teach at the university, where we create interactive materials as well, one of the main things when we're creating the simulations that we create in the games, very, very important is what do you do in the debriefing? And, and in fact, I was a, 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 a jury, I think was was name, uh, an evaluator or something like that for an, an, an organization. And they were, you know, giving a cert- certificate to, to this other organization who created this game. One of the things, one of the comments that, that the three of us, the three of uh, the, the judges that we were there, was the main comment was, this game is fantastic. I'm sure after you leave from this, you probably know new things. The only problem is it's not considering, and, and literally didn't have any, again, with a, a facilitator or not, it didn't have a debriefing. So our main comment was, maybe even if you learn things, you have them sort of interiorized in, in a very subconscious way. If you don't bring that to the forefront, you don't make it mindful, you don't realize all those things that you have learned, applying will then be very, very difficult because you don't know that you don't know or you don't know that you know. And that makes it a lot, in my opinion, it, it, it was that, that final phase, even if it's final, if it's, as you were saying, 75%, you know, 20%, whatever that is, it is very important to be able to cement that learning, cement that experience that you had to be able, in, again, in, in my humble opinion, to be able to do these things. And it's, I think it's fantastic that you created this tool that is geared at changing maybe a little bit our mindsets in that sense. So how did you come up with this idea? How, how did the, the briefing cube come to be? <laughs> well, we, we can tell you the story. Just on, on that topic, though, I think you can, you can look at it as a, a kind of uh, you measure on hit rate, right? So let's imagine we, we've played a game um, where we know that there's some really cool things to learn from this game. Now, you can play the game alone and people will enjoy it and do this and, and you'll have a certain hit rate, right? Or people that manage to see from that experience, ah, oh, okay, cool, a couple of epiphanies have, 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 have occurred. Um, the debrief is the catalyst for that, right? So we, if we um, take the time, and as Julian says, we should take, a really good amount of time for this to to reflect about what just happened and 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 in all sorts of different ways um we start to increase that hit rate right we start to get more people seeing that experience and 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 connecting it to their own experience in their own worlds uh, and then more epiphanies going off okay and then you see this magical thing that then begins to happen is that when one person starts to talk about what they've just perceived from their experience that triggers more hits and other people as they're starting to see the thing that they've experienced from someone else's point of view, right? And and this catalyzation of different points of view, different experiences shared and reflected means that at the end of that brief, you really maximize the potential that that game could have had, mm. which we think is absolutely magic. Yeah, absolutely. So I, 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 would, I would say, you know, through this debriefing conversation, or maybe even just by posing the questions, you can make this individual experiences or all of the individual experiences really into a shared experience for a group or a team. And and that's where yeah, the power comes from. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I have to agree with that. And thank you for sort of jumping in and making making that that point, which was absolutely fantastic. And getting getting back to the, the question before, because I do think <laughs> We, we draw a lot of inspiration from these things because it's, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we will find a lot of um, inspiration and a lot of use for the debriefing queue, which we'll get into details right now. But that stage of how did you come up mm. with it? What happened? What triggered it maybe as well? Like, I, I'd like to, to, to get the engagers into your minds mm. in that sense so that we can also, again, draw inspiration and see maybe some of the engagers will get into something similar as well. Yeah. So, look. We have both been part of the Play 14 uh, community, and we both have been at the first Play 14 in Romania, Timisoara. 
And uh, that was 2017, right? So three years ago. Uh, in fact, yeah, three years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, we, we offered a couple of sessions and uh, we observed each other's and um, you know, eventually we, we, we started talking or seeing that we were asking the same debriefing questions over and over, right? Oh, what did you observe? How did you feel? What was this experience like? You know, and everyone has his or her favorite debriefing questions, which, which are, you know, good in a sense. And then, um, yeah, Chris and I, we, we just kept this conversation on, uh, Chris, I don't know, for, for a year <laughs> via Zoom and Skype and uh, just talking about what would be if we could, you know, unlock um, d- different angles or if we could, um, you know, minimize blind spots, uh, both both sides, right, for from the participants and players' side, but also from the facilitator side. And um, that that was the initial start, wasn't it, Chris? Did I forget something in that story? Wait, well, yeah, you're you're very kind, but uh, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, Julian knows that that's slightly slightly less um, less even uh, than than he's admitting, because um, uh, he's already when when I met Julian, he was already excellent at this, right? Julian is excellent at most things, very annoying as a person. Um, <laughs> uh, and he had observed um, uh, me using the same debriefing questions quite a lot. And it, uh, but we had gotten friendly uh, enough for him to be comfortable to challenge me on that, which is wonderful. Um, so actually, I think I recall, Julian, um, that actually within the same weekend, we drafted the first debriefing cube. Uh, very simple, very, um, you know, embryonic. But we, 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 we had this epiphany that, um, the, this uh, this ability that we all expected to have this this uh, the skill set to to be able to you know facilitate a game and then lead a great debrief is just taken for granted, right? Which assumes that everyone can just do it, and it isn't particularly well loved or well written about. You know that you can't go and train to get to become a good debriefer, um, uh, and you know and if we think about it, it's absolutely necessary and key, uh, you know, if, if, if we are to be able to lead people with, with this type of experience and, and help them get the most out of it. Uh, so it's a problem. This is a problem. Right? We're in this whole community, which is founded upon playfulness and gaming uh, to, to, as, a, as a vehicle to learn, um, which requires this art form called debriefing. And yet, you know, if we look around, it isn't particularly mastered, right? Mm-hmm. With, with the, you know, Julian, you know, as, as being an exception, I would say, uh, the, the, the generally speaking, people sort of just blunder through it, get through it because they know they have to, even though it's uncomfortable. So we thought maybe we should do something about that. Maybe this is maybe we could build something to help people get better at this thing. Yeah. You know, let's find the pathway to mastery. Uh, and that's what we designed in that weekend. We put it together. The play, Playful Team works as an open space, so we just took a bit of time out. We got some paper and some pens, and um, and we, we created this thing, and then we we tested it. I think in the same in the same weekend. Yeah, in that weekend, and then um, I guess the, the first. I, I remember when I was scribbling the uh, the icons. That that was when I flew back from Luxembourg. So I guess um, like like half a year later or so, we presented it at another play for teen in Luxembourg, and then you know got some early feedback, obviously on on the questions and the lenses. I guess they weren't really called lenses back in the days, and I guess it, it, <laughs> the original version also had like a seven lens that was inside of the cube, but you know that was just too complicated <laughs> in one way. But um, <laughs> look, uh, let's be honest. There there are lots of you know, game descriptions out there, uh, books and, and, and websites, et cetera. And of course, they will feature one or two, maybe even more um, debriefing questions. But what they're losing is, um, A, the context that you specifically are offering and facilitating the game, the, um, you know, topic of the day that you want to be discovered, that you were hired for, that you, um, you know, had on the agenda or have on the agenda. And the players i mean who are your participants what are, what are they up to what, what, are, what is their language right what, what are they um observing um and then obviously personal preferences of the facilitator right so i guess we need a, a, a whole set of a awareness um during the simulation and before and the design process and we need definitely uh to nudge uh, lots of facilitators out there that there are more than 20 questions that you one could ask <laughs> or one <laughs> or one yeah 
So you're, you're, I would say it, it seems, at least from the outside, that you are basically inspired by making questions. Would that be an appropriate observation? I guess we were inspired by, I was inspired by Julian, and we were inspired by the opportunity. The, the, the questions came quite a bit later, actually. Um, the, the, the cube began with with um, with the lenses, is, or what they came to be called the lenses. It's called a cube, by the way. So if you can, if you can imagine in your mind now a cube, uh, dice, yeah? Um, and um, we called it that because we came up with six different, well, seven, as you mentioned, the internal, but six different <laughs> sides uh, uh, that would um, we could think about as um, different ways to approach the debriefing questions, different sorts of lines of questioning or um, explorations or curiosity to, to um, you can, you can, you can just take those six different things and, 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 and debrief, uh, debrief in every situation in each of those ways, which kind of takes from where we were beginning, which was like, we were, we were in a place where everyone was asking one or two or three sort of standard questions, giving us, you know, six different pools of, of different questions to, to explore um which is where it began and then it and then it kind of evolved from there and yeah and, and i was you know um inspired by by the conversation we we started and again it it, it, it I, I remember us you know putting together a first draft and then the lenses and really discussing every word and challenging us and um experimenting <laughs> with it testing it obviously the early feedback and then you know going out there and and just um uh, asking that question what is your favorite debriefing question and have you considered using xyz right and then um eventually you know the the list became better and better and the um yeah the, the the debriefing cube became a product right which we are giving away free i don't know if we've mentioned that this is all like a creative commons um uh, license because um i we think this is way more important than us um you know making money out of it which which is not illegal it is not immoral but it is very 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 nice that you guys are, are giving this away for free absolutely for sure and and that is absolutely fantastic as well i i mean as part of the community or the potential people that could be utilizing this i i would definitely have to thank you guys for for offering this uh, sort of openly and now that we're, we're get, sort of getting into it we know where it comes from can you spend i don't know five eight minutes explaining of course remember this is a podcast usually you know things like a cube are easier <laughs> seen than than other things but i mean i'm sure you you've you've done this a few times and you can we have a very smart audience as well our engagers have been through this many times so is there is there i mean can you give us a again five maybe 10 minutes explanation of how the cube would work or and of course lead us into where we can find uh, maybe a bit more visual information as well all right chris i'll start and then you just Jump in, or we we take turns, right? So yes, the cube, this card game, um, one hundred fifty yes. questions, um, <laughs> and a dice. Um, it, that's that's the, the the setup, right? And um, I'll go and explain the lenses, and then we can maybe uh, read some questions and uh, the the. the how to use the, the the set of tool or the, the tool then in general maybe all right so let's start with the lenses okay six lenses six side of a die and um it's all about the goal so you can you know focus your learners after or even before assimilation on the goal or on the process or on group dynamics on communication obviously on emotions or on the takeaways Right. So these are the six lenses and every lens comes with uh, a couple of questions and it is a card deck, literally. Right. It's a it's a, uh, a deck of cards. You can print them out, you can cut them and then you will have uh, four questions on every card. You will have a main question. And then, you know, as the conversation is going on, you might want to make use of the deepening questions, as, as we call them, or follow up questions. OK. And um, how can you use them? You, again, when you design a, a workshop, a meeting, um, a learning experience, uh, you can, of course, uh, have a look at the set and uh, pick your favorite questions, right? 
pick the questions that, again, make sense for the topic at hand, for the group that you will be facilitating, and, of course, personal preferences. And for that, and I think this is, I don't know, it's underrated. People tend to forget. There are also some cards in the deck where you can write your own favorite question. So we strongly encourage every facilitator to not just copy and paste our tool and to use those questions exactly as they're written, but to, you know, think about, um, uh, yeah, who, who are you focusing? Uh, what is what is the language that they would like to use? And maybe you have wonderful coaching or uh, powerful question asking skills and then you can obviously um add them to the set all right chris over to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that, i mean that that's the kind of the inspiration thing so thinking as a, a facilitator um how i would use the deck is, is that way really is that i'm thinking about the game i'm about to play um or the experience you're about to have i'm thinking about you know what i expect to ha happen um, therefore, I can pick some kind of cool questions which will seem like they have a good flow to them, and they, it gives me, you know, gives me something of a preparation so that when I go into the debrief, I'm kind of armed and ready to ask some cool questions. Um, sometimes just going through the deck kind of um, inspires you. Oh, that's a really nice question. Maybe I can just do a, a version of that. And 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 often what happens, I have to then then pair back all of these wonderful questions into a series of okay, these 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 are the right questions, and then take them in. Things sometimes change when you do the debrief. But at least you, know, you have that. I know I'm no longer going to be asking the one standard "How did you feel?" type question. I'm going to ask me lots of different questions. I'm looking at lots of different angles. Um, what huh. so what happened next though, is really interesting. Actually, this is um, evolutionary design at its best. Um, is that uh, we discovered that um, well, part of our rationale in designing this tool was we had a persona in mind. We were thinking about. Uh, some like a, a new facilitator, someone who's, who's new to facilitation and who's facilitating their first game. Okay, that's our persona. This, this is the person we really wanted to help, right? Because we feel like if we help that person, we're probably helping everybody else as well. Um, and what we realized is that actually we could use this tool, so these questions, uh, in a way that's very self organized, um, so that you don't need to have that ability to stand in front of people and ask them lots of questions and hear their answers and ask more questions and follow up and go deeper and go wider and all those sorts of things you do in a normal debrief you can give them this deck of cards and allow them to ask find a question and ask that question of each other uh, in their in their group or in their team um, and then the whole experience of the debrief and the conversation that ensues becomes to some extent uh, self-organized which which is kind of cool because it takes away any requirement of facilitation skill and it also takes away the limitation of scale. So if you want to run a big, a big experience with, you know, hundreds of people, um, the, the, the using the tool in this way where people can find their own questions and, and, and reflect and lead their own reflection in, in some small groups is a magical thing. Mm. So, so this is that one of the next ways of using the tool is, is to, um, it, there's kind of two ways to go about it. Either you give them the whole deck, and we give them a, we give them a dice. Um, the dice is, is it's got the, the the six lenses on it rather than numbers or dots, mm -hmm. and they they use the dice to randomise a, a reflection question, and they ask that, that that question of each other to reflect upon the the the, uh, the experience they had. And, and, and you might think, okay, well, how do you know that's going to be relevant? And that's one of the questions that was like in my mind when we ran this as an experiment. You know, is the question you're going to you're going to get randomised always relevant? But there's something magical happens with the the art of conversation and the human brain that kind of draws connections to the question that you ask. You know, whether you would have asked that question to begin with or not, and the people find those connections and have a great conversation anyway. Um, so it's so it's kind of it's kind of cool. The the other way to do this is is that you can do the preparation thing, right? So if you know that actually this is a really nice series of questions which kind of explore the experience you know that they've just had in a certain way, you can give them that series and they can go through the questions one by one, asking each other those questions and then exploring it. Um, and then you, you could then finish up that entire sort of experience with some sharing so that we, remember we want to get that kind of catalyst effect of more, more people hearing and being inspired by other people. And then your debrief is kind of nailed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
Huh. There, there are even, you know, some ways in between that, right? For example, you could get, give every learner one card and have them interact in, um, you know, in a series of conversations with other players and, you know, their question. Um, and I think, Chris, what I love about this um, self-debriefing approach, or if you break up um, a, a larger group or even a small group into individual debriefing conversations, there are two things that are magical about that. Number one, the time to speak about your experience after assimilation or game is reduced. Okay, so you can you can, again. This is just a half a minute thing. Okay, here's some cards. Find a partner. Talk about the questions. Okay, so while the experience is still fresh, you can still sense it and feel it, and the memory is still fresh. You can already um, digest it and talk about it and and hear from others. Okay, that that's what I uh, love. And obviously, you can harvest some simultaneously from many players in the room and even observers, okay, if we, could, if we integrate them, of course, into the debriefing. And uh, that's something that I just, yeah, love about it. And for that, we even have a self-debriefing card with instructions. So you don't even have to read it as a facilitator. <laughs> you just give them a card and it says, okay, read this card, make sure that everyone speaks, uh, start the conversation using the, um, the, the dice or then the, the main question, et cetera, et cetera. So you guys basically made a game for debriefing games or learning games at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds absolutely fantastic. And I I do have a question. Like it sounds like it's very self-organized, and I'm sure I'm sure it is, but the, the, my question is, how do you know it's it's over? I mean, wh- when does does the game what's the end game here? You have to time box it. So so this is an interesting thing we discovered when we first tried this as an experiment. Right, we figured we played we played a really simple game, right? So uh, I think it was Go, or we, we've subsequently done it with um, like simple games like Counter Thirty Three and um, yeah, and Boeing. I think we did that. So really, like these like warm ups are not really like you, they're not like your really big concept games where there's lots to learn. They're kind of small warm up activities. With, 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 you know, there's still learnings in them, but they're much more subtle. So we we expected to. We just wanted because really just needed to create to create an experience so that we could test the tool out, right? So we created the simplest and basic most basic experience we could think of, and then set people up into small groups of three or four, gave them all a deck of cards each, uh, and then say go go debrief. Um, and, and we were just, we were actively facilitating, so we're just watching and listening and sensing, and you know quite ready to pull people back together again when it feels like they're running out of steam. Except they didn't run out of steam. Yeah, they, they, they carried on. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and it's like, geez, this is like we're 20 minutes into debriefing a five minute game. That's weird. Um, so so you, you have to time box it because it, it it's a conversation starter. It's a conversation enabler. It, it invites people to talk about things and they can really get in that zone. Yeah, so I think you, you you have to give a little bit of limit to that, uh, and some of the things that Julie mentioned earlier, that using liberating structures a bit to to maybe govern some of that interaction is, is a useful thing if you to, to help you keep it time boxed. And, and and I would I would add, you know, as we all know, um it, if you attend a conference and then of course you want to explore new tools, you want to be inspired, you want to discuss, you want to have those endless, endless discussions that go on all, all night long until, um, you know, we, we all start to play werewolves. But um the um <laughs> we, we shouldn't forget that um, if you have a team, if you are hired to facilitate um, a workshop or a training, um, you do have a context, right? And you do have a topic. So I would say it ends when you are uh, moving towards that zone um, that you want or you want to help or you want to facilitate your um learners to explore and to touch and to discuss and to see and to reflect on okay so that's why um, it's not that you know uh we hand out the cards and then we just you know ring a bell after half an hour and hopefully they'll have some (laughs) meaningful conversation in a while 
you as a facilitator still <laughs> need to, you know, that, that that's our job, right? You need to be there. You need to sense, as Chris said, you need to observe, you need to hear, you need to listen. Uh, what are they talking about? Is this a fruitful conversation? Does this conversation add value to where you are um, going and your design is going? And yeah, definitely time box. Um and and listen and be open be be ready to be surprised as we say right because <laughs> um you know it's so amazing uh, chris mentioned you know the the boing game or the the go game or you know again probably with with every game that we facilitators facilitate um you sometimes you know, you know what's going to happen. You know what they're going to say. Do you know exactly the minute they will have a problem and then you give them the hint, right? But let's go back for a second. Um, you design and facilitate, ex- you know, games or learning games, uh, serious games, so that your learners can make an experience. So why don't we step back for a moment and just are willing and are ready to be surprised. So listen to your learners, see what they are focusing on. And that might be something completely different than you have, you know, on your agenda. Um, But maybe that adds more value to um, their day to day than, you know, what, what you've have just, uh, um, you know, planned out for them to discover. So, so that's also, I think a a big reminder we, we should always um, say. It makes a lot of sense, actually. I think those are great reminders as well. It's just on that point. I, I, just sorry, so just I just I think yeah. that's such an important characteristic of the of the thing that's that's for me one of the another magical moment that happened is is I, I just just thinking very personally. I, in, in the past, when I facilitated a game, I've fallen into the trap of um, of of aborting the debrief and then telling people this is what you should have learned, right? This is this is why we played yeah. the game, right? This is the, this is the thing I hoped you would learn from the game, right? Uh, because it's super easy to do that as a facilitator, as a coach, right? Because I know why I played the game in the first place, and this is what I wanted you to see. Um, and uh, and you, I see lots of coaches doing that. I see lots of coaches going to that place where, um, of really um, of of downloading uh, the 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 um, the or trying to download the epiphanies rather than to to, to culture them. Um, the, using the, the cube in the way we've explained, right? When you've you've now distributed the learning, you've distributed the conversation. You can't do that anymore, right? You have to step back and allow the your participants to make from the experience whatever they will make from that experience. And sometimes that's not going to be what you expected it to be, and that's okay. Yeah. And I think it's a it's a marvelous sort of characteristic that helps us be better facilitators. And um, l- let me um, add. Uh, Rob, two two more ways how you could use this card deck. Okay, it's 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 also a card deck, and we do encourage you to either cut it and um, uh, and and have the cards at hand. So while you are observing your group engaging in a learning game or serious game or agile game, um, you can flick through the cards, literally questions, and then select them in real time, right? So that that is also powerful. Um, you might have prepared a, 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 some questions, but then you, um, you, you know, you just you sense and then engage with the field or the energy or the topics and the flow of um, the engagement of your of your learners. And another way um, would be, and that's something that I'm. Doing more and more, you could even share one or two debriefing questions before the game, priming your learners to um, obviously a specific um, 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 yeah, observation that they might be able to make. Again, you really want to use this carefully. Um, as, as Chris just mentioned, you know, sometimes we just have in mind what should happen and what should be discovered and then what should be said afterwards. Um, but that's also a nice way to just say, okay, at the um, end of the game, I will ask you, you know, um, what type of miscommunication was there? You're just naming a random question from 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 the deck. That makes sense. Um, I, I think the the sort of the end game there is is a is a key point because otherwise you you can get sort of lost as as you guys were saying you can get lost in the process so to speak. Um, but I think it it makes a lot of sense like d- dealing with it that way. 
I, I think it's a it's a fantastic solution. Is there, I don't know, is there? I mean, we're we're basically on getting getting to the end of our of our time together today. But is there a quick example, a time? I don't know. Again, without revealing anything, you can't reveal. But a time you've seen it used, you used it yourself that that particularly reminds you of something very powerful. We, we like to to get into examples, of course. That that always helps. I mean, you know, I've used it a, a lot in various workshops and offsites and things. Um, I, I guess for me that the powerfulness comes in because I'm the we, we created this thing right and, and and if you've ever created anything you'll know that you're never 100 percent happy with it <laughs> yeah you never you never completely sold upon this is always going to work right because we made this and it is a stomach we came out of our heads uh, and for me the magic is like you know is in that listening and the sensing and you hear people talking and 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 reflecting and, and and you can see them that oh yeah the conversation is going and they're talking about some cool stuff and what those guys are talking about over there is completely different to what those guys are talking about over there but it's all on point it's all about the experience um and, and then you can start to get this sense of relief that oh, okay yeah this is this is they're getting, they're getting some cool outcomes here they're getting some cool thoughts and concepts coming across and um you know and, and almost you're going to get like an early feeling that my job of facilitator is done yeah because they have just nailed it right they've they've they've, 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 they've used from the experience everything i'd hoped that i would do and <laughs> in, in for me it's it's i would say the inclusiveness that you know with with the with not only the set or the variety of the questions but also how it is designed with you know the cards and the dies and you know it just invites to 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 add to um adding value to add to the reflection to add to the group and then you know eventually to add to this shared experience and um and to not only see and observe why someone did something or why someone acted that way or um, didn't act that way, but also to make this um, implicit knowledge explicit so that the teams or the groups can then really um, connect to, let's call it motives or the reason why or um, the uh, selective um you know, observation, uh, observation skills, or that that they really connect to each other, literally, right? And and that's that's powerful. And um, yeah, if a question helps, then then that that would be the tool of my choice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, sounds very very sensible. It makes a lot of sense. So, Julian, Chris, thank you very much both for, of course, creating this debriefing cube and, of course, putting it out there. And also for being with us today, I, I know you. I know Julian is a very recent, or relatively recent father. So you know all those fathering businesses that you know of um, are there, and you know you still have to do them. And taking away some of that time from from all those things that you have to do, your your child is probably <laughs> sleeping at this point. Risking <laughs> the, the the child to wake up is is a, is an accomplishment as well. I'm, it seems like we succeeded in not waking Julian's kid up at this point. Yeah, I'll have a look. I'll have a look now. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to both of you for. A- anyways, I mean, it's not just Julian. Chris, of course, made it made an effort to be with us today and sharing all of this information with us with the engagers. Um, is there any final, you know, piece of advice anywhere you want to lead us to? Of course, where we can find more information about the debriefing cube before before we say it's game over. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, um, look, the debriefing cube, and this is also a, a big community effort. So we started in English language, obviously, and then we had, um, as you all know, I'm based in Berlin. I do speak German, um, but we had um, learners and players engaging in translating the tool into German, into French, into Dutch, into Russian, and um, Italian and Spanish are on the way. So, um, you know, this is also a big thank you for for everyone who's who's helped us to um translate those questions into um different languages big shout out for sure and um secondly yes there is also a product now if you don't want to copy it and you just want to buy it which is totally fine it's reasonable price you can also buy the card decks um they are sustainably um produced printed very very locally just around the corner of my house and they're um packed and sent and shipped out in an integration workshop here south of berlin so um that's just another yeah reason to to um order them and um besides that 
thedebriefingcube.com, thedebriefingcube.de. And um, you can download and grab the PDF directly from there. You don't need to enter a password, no email address. Just go to the website and enjoy reading. <laughs> Sounds absolutely fantastic, guys. Thanks again for, for all your efforts, all the things that you, you're doing, that you've been doing, you're going to be doing in the future with the debriefing cube. Chris, I don't know if there's anything else. I just add to that in terms of we'd love to hear from you, right? So if, if you are using the tool, if it is working for you, if you have any experiences, please reach out and tell us about them because it really helps us um, feel good about, you know, the, 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 the debrief, the art of debriefing across the world is getting better. And it, <laughs> also then this isn't the end for our journey, right? We, we have more ideas coming in the future about how we can accelerate this art form even more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks very much for your time for your efforts, for being here with us today. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this interview about the debriefing cube with Chris and Julian. And, you know, they'll probably be back on the podcast in the future. Is there any questions you'd like to ask them or any other guests? Go to professorgame.com slash question and ask your question. There's a very good chance it'll be selected. And if it does, it'll come up in a future episode and you will get your answer live during an episode of Professor Game. Before you go on to your next mission, please remember to subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there. <laughs>